Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel again. So excited to have you here. Um, I'm excited about this video today. It was an idea I had while I was taking a shower. So it's one of those shower thoughts ideas. And uh, uh, for it to make sense, I have to give you a little bit of backstory on me. So I have my bachelor's degree in theater with an emphasis in acting and my master's degree in English and creative writing. So the way I tell people is I got my bachelor's in pretending and my master's in telling stories. So my original idea, my original like goal in life was to become a uh, either a theater or a literature professor and teach writing, acting, playwriting, directing, something along those lines. And uh, as many people who went to school for the liberal arts can tell you, uh, none of that happened. None of that worked out. Uh, that's not what was in the card. But I still have like the ideas these days of like, if I were still a teacher, what would my curriculum be depending on what class? And I might do a few of these videos, but today I'm going to talk about two books that I would recommend for someone who is interested in learning how to write. And now just to be very clear, these are not going to be nonfiction works. They're not gonna be like On Writing by Stephen King or Bird by Bird by uh, Anne Lamott. Those are great books on like the nuts and bolts of the craft, but I'm talking specifically two novels. I'm only doing two. Two novels that I think encapsulate uh, everything that fiction is capable of, like not necessarily weird fiction, like the weird books that I do on TikTok, but like, let's say like standard fiction is capable of and it's done really well. So you, as the prospective author, can analyze what is happening in these books and interpret it through your own lens. First and foremost, a lot of people, their first questions about getting started writing is about style, right? How do I find my style? How do I figure out what my style is? Style this, style that, oh, stylo, yes. And I like to refer people to the Neil Gaiman quote that uh, your style is your mistakes. And what that means is if your writing were absolutely perfect grammatically, there were no errors, you had the perfectly built plots, you had perfectly created characters, your novel would be the most boring thing in the world because it would be so uniform, so predictable, and so just generic, because perfection is generic, that no one would care. So, the first thing to sort of free yourself is to know that you will make mistakes, you will miss opportunities, and some of your writing, a lot of your writing, will suck. Keep going. Now with that in mind, in my perception, there are two sort of directions you can go with writing fiction. There is the simple story told really, really well, and then there is the complex story told in a grandiose way. Now there is a spectrum between those two areas that you can sort of like mix and match and have like a little bit of like a la carte when it comes to writing. But I believe like those are the two main archetypes and everything else kind of falls in that range. I'm sure some of you will disagree. I'm excited to have a discussion about it in the comments. So uh, politely tell me if you think I'm wrong in the comments and uh, we'll, we'll talk it out. We'll, we'll, we'll figure this one out, you and me. We'll come to, we'll come to an accord. But starting off with the simple story told really, really well. For that, my recommendation is going to be Stoner by John Williams. No, not John Williams, the composer. <laughs> no one man should have all that power. Are you kidding me? Like he's making binary sunset while he's writing this novel. Like it would be unfair. It would be unfair. Um, but no, it's a different John Williams. And a quick brief overview. Of, it tells the story of the titular William Stoner who goes from being a poor farm boy to uh, going to college, falling in love with literature, becoming an academic, becoming a professor, and then eventually um, dying. Spoiler alert for a 60 year old novel. So that's the rather simple story, right? There's nothing particularly groundbreaking about that. It happens every day all the time, everywhere. But the way that the story is told is what makes it interesting. So the story itself is very intimate. You get to know Stoner very closely. You know, in particular, his dreams. Like that is the um, sort of like little 
grain of truth, the, the Arkenstone within the mountain of a man that Stoner is, like the important center of him, is his aspirations, his dreams, uh, what he wants to accomplish in his career and in his life. One of the first nuts and bolts things that you will learn about writing is that your character has a want, you need to put up obstacles for them. Something that gets between them and their goals, otherwise they just achieve their goals and it's not interesting to watch. Hooray! And for Stoner, those obstacles come in a lot of different forms. It's sort of like the death by a thousand cuts, if you will. Like, things like, um, he and his wife don't get along, so she kind of stymies him a little. I'll circle back to Edith in a minute, though, because I think she is one of the most unnecessarily reviled characters in, uh, in literature. There's politics within his work where it makes things more difficult for him. There's war that happens. Uh, there's just circumstance that gets in between him and the woman that he had an affair with. And just every little thing just starts pushing his ambition further and further out of reach. And what's interesting is watching this man have to come to terms with the fact that he will not fulfill his goals. And will he find some measure of contentment in that realization? This is the Edith sidebar. A lot of people talk shit about Edith. Um, I remember when I did my stoner video, like there were a few people in the videos who were like, oh, Edith is terrible, Edith is terrible. This is one of the interesting side effects of being able to tell a story so closely from one character's point of view that it makes you not stop to think about the other character's point of view. So in defense of Edith, she was kind of sold a raw deal on this marriage. She didn't really want to get married, but it just kind of happened. She didn't get the life that she wanted from stoner and it was actually a real step down in social status, and he sexually assaults her. It's not really ambiguous, it happens, but it's the sort of way, the way that it's treated is because the novel was written like 60 years ago, and that's when the idea of like, oh, a man pressuring his wife into having sex, that's just, that's just the way marriage is, and we know better now. And then when you consider Edith's behavior from that point of view, from the point of view of her unfulfilled dreams and from the trauma that she's experienced, all of a sudden, the things that she's doing start to make sense. She comes between Stoner and their daughter. Yeah, she wants someone in her life. So that's my little sidebar about Edith. But it feeds really nicely into the idea of telling stories that the reader has to look into a little bit and challenge their conceptions about. So like, hey, that worked out kind of well. Edith, you deserved better. You did some kind of um, shady things, I'm not gonna lie, but hey, so did Stoner. Um, yeah, you're human too and should be given the leeway that we give the main character. So that was my breakdown on like a simple story told well. Now what about the other one where it's a complex story told grandiosely? if you will. And for that, I think there's no better example than A Naked Singularity by Sergio de la Pava. A Naked Singularity is a difficult novel to sort of like summarize. On its surface, it's kind of a legal drama. Like you follow the main character, Kasi, who is a public defender who's never lost a case before, and you follow him through trying to make sure that like, hey, he doesn't lose a case and he doesn't let these people down. But from there too, it's also kind of a heist novel. And at the same time there, it's kind of about boxing and it's kind of about TV and the role that it plays in our lives and stories and what they play in our lives and good versus evil and self-actualization. Like these are all explicit moments in the novel and it can be dizzying to try to keep up with them all. So what makes this type of storytelling work where there are so many disparate elements? I believe it comes down to gestalt storytelling. So what do I mean by that? Well, a gestalt is a thing, we're off to a great start, where the end result is greater than the sum of its parts. So very often, like, you can point to uh, groups of people, right? Led Zeppelin is greater than the sum of their parts. On paper, they're all great musicians together. They're amazing. In particular, the Beatles, let's say. Like, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, on their own, never accomplished what the Beatles could accomplish. They are greater than the sum of their parts. 
But when it comes to storytelling, a gestalt is an interesting opportunity to really see if you can stick a really cool landing. So what I mean is, Naked Singularity has this central character where all of these disparate things are happening to him. Now they are happening to him for a reason. Sergio de la Pava is a great author. He's not just sort of like flailing about in the dark and being like, oh, I'll throw this into my novel and see if it works. He's not Stephanie Meyer. So there's some reason why all of these disparate elements are in the novel. And once we begin to interrogate that idea, then we start to see the relationships between each part. We see how each part recontextualizes each other part, how they comment on each other, how they illuminate one another. And that is super fascinating. It's difficult to do because you have to make sure in any sort of non-linear, let's say non-realistic, or um, non-straightforward, non-stoner-esque story, let's say, that you are giving the audience a fighting chance of understanding what the hell is going on here. Samuel Beckett, great example. In his plays, he gives you a fighting chance of understanding what's going on. There's enough context clues to sort of like piece it all together. Whereas like the Dadaist artists, their goal is to completely obscure their point behind everything else. And that's why it's not really a art form that I feel uh, has a lot of legacy, has a lot of legs behind it, uh, because it's just random for random sake. Nobody really likes random for random sake, except for in their internet memes. So all of these disparate elements come together to tell a convoluted story in a grandiose way. And it's beautiful to behold. There are moments where things come together in such a way they click for you as a reader that you are just struck with awe of how good Sergio de la Pava pulls this off. It's incredible. So now let's get to you as the writer. We've got this sort of like continuum that I've laid out here uh, between a simple story told well and a convoluted story told grandiosely. And like I said, there is a spectrum, but kind of like a matrix in there too, of the simpleness to complexity of your story, the and the scope of your story, from narrow in scope to encompassing all of creation. Where does your story fall on there? Now, a lot of um, writing teachers, and I think to a certain extent I as well, get behind the idea of story statements. Where, for example, E.T., the story statement could be, um, a young boy helps an alien get home. There's a lot more to that movie. There's a lot more to that story, but at its core, that's the story that we're telling, right? Um, a group of superheroes come together to uh, bring down a powerful supervillain. How many movies could that be, right? It's the details, the details, I just like doing this, details that make your story yours. So within that story structure, then you can start to expand it and find where it is on our sort of matrix. And then while you're writing the story, the mistakes are going to be your style. So don't sweat it, just keep writing. You have to keep plugging away. You can't wait for inspiration. Because if you wait for inspiration, you will never finish anything. Trust me, I know. All right, so that's sort of like my recommendation, my overview of how I would teach a, uh, a fiction writing class and the two novels that I would use for the touchstone. Frankly, I really enjoyed making this video. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, I wanna make more like it. So what other classes would you like me to teach for you? Uh, or at least tell you the books that I would use to teach. Let me know in the comments. I think that would be super fun. It'd be a really cool series. And uh, help me actually do something with my education <laughs> rather than uh, what I'm currently doing with it, which is um, holding up books on a uh, dancing app for kids. I love you guys, I really do. Um, hey, if you made it to the end of the video and you're not subscribed already, what are you doing? Subscribe, hit the bell, that's something that YouTubers say, right? Um, leave a comment down below, I already said that. Um, yeah, 
Oh yeah, follow me on the other socials, TikTok, Jen Insight, Instagram, Jen underscore Insight. <sighs> Makes me sad. Um, and once again, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I, I get a lot of enjoyment out of these videos and hearing from all of you that you get enjoyment out of these videos really means a lot to me. So uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. I will catch you next time. Love you.